You'll notice as I go through this presentation that the presentation that our outlook is very focused on consumers, future consumer, where those consumers will be located. Um, it's also focused on what types of energy choices those consumers will be uh, utilizing, as well as our best estimates on what technology developments will bring us in the areas of supply as well as energy efficiency. Um, like I said, we use this study internally, so the purpose of this uh, study is not to develop some rosy picture that fits our business model. We're very interested in developing a realistic uh, outlook on energy use, energy consumption, and, and uh, production in the future so that, again, we can apply it to our own internal business decisions. I'm sure many of you are wondering and probably primed to ask the question, how has this outlook changed in, the, in light of today's oil prices? Uh, quite a dramatic drop in the price of oil, I think over $100 a barrel uh, just as recently as 2014. I think this morning it's around $28, $29 a barrel. I mean, quite a dramatic change. Um, but what you'll see in this outlook is uh, not much has changed. Uh, the oversupply situation that we're in today that's driving low oil prices. Demand is not quite where, has not recovered quite as, uh, as much as we thought, you know, people th thought it would. And we've been producing excess uh, supplies of oil and gas recently. So it's a short term oversupply situation that won't last. And so when we look at the outlook, we're looking in the long-term trends for supply and demand. And so while we're going through a big dip in oil prices today, it really isn't, hasn't changed our outlook on where the energy industry will be in 2040. Uh, and the, main, the reason for that is because there's two main drivers for energy consumption. The number of people in the world, as well as the living standards of that population. Uh, there's roughly 7 billion people in the world today, and we expect uh, by 2040 that the population will grow by roughly 25% uh, to around 9 billion people by the year 2040. At the same time, it's expected that the global gross domestic product will increase dramatically. Uh, in fact, it will more than double uh, over the outlook period and it'll rise much faster than the rise in population. And that's significant. What that translates into is an, a raising of the living standards of everybody around the world. So while the population is growing by 25%, we will generate over a 100% uh, increase in uh, economic output. So next we'll see, we see where uh, energy demand is going. So similar to population, we project that overall energy demand from all sources of energy, electricity, natural gas, nuclear, wind, solar, oil, uh, will grow about 25%. Uh, now that's pretty phenomenal when you look at it because GDP is a, tri a tremendous driver for energy consumption. So, but while GDP is growing significantly by 100%, demand for energy will only grow about 25%. And that's, a, um, and that's because of a shift um, in the types of fuels we're using, increases in efficiency um, in, in how we consume our energy. Along the way, we also project that the global um, emissions of carbon dioxide or carbon emissions will continue to rise but peak around the year 2030 and ultimately start to uh, decline in the latter part of the outlook period. And this is driven by a shift to less carbon intensive fuels such as natural gas uh, nuclear. So this graph is really overall a very positive story. It's a story of a growing population and a population that's going to raise their living standards and consume more energy, but thanks to energy efficiency, the demand for energy won't grow near as fast as GDP, and thanks to a shift in less carbon intensive types of energy, an ultimate decrease in the amount of carbon emissions. 
So for my talk today, I'd like to talk through six key themes. First, kind of alluded to in the previous slide, that energy is fundamental to our standards of living. As you raise your standard of living, you consume more energy. You add that microwave, you add that washing machine, you add a refrigerator, you add multiple TVs, smartphones, etc. You consume more energy as your living standard increases. Uh, second, that energy demand, as you'll see a theme throughout my presentation today, the increase in energy demand is primarily driven by GDP and living standards. The other theme that you'll note is that that's primarily in developing nations. It's not in the developed portion of the world. Uh, the type of fuels that we use, the mix of energy, will be largely driven by the economics of the various uh, fuel sources, as well as policies, government policies. And that oil will remain the world's primary fuel through 2040. Later in the presentation, you'll see that the mix of fuel uh, or mix of types of energies will change quite a bit, but oil will still continue to be the number one source of energy through 2040. But the demand for natural gas, you'll see this theme over and over again, the demand for natural gas is going to grow more than any other source of energy. And there's a couple of reasons behind that, and I'll go into more detail on that later. And then lastly, uh, all of this is made possible. The, the development of new sources of energy, the improvement in the efficiency in which we use energy, is all made possible by technology. So let's start with the first theme living standards. Here you'll see how various uh, countries score on the United Nations Human Development uh, Index. So on the right hand, left hand side is the Human Development Index. It's a score that takes into account life expectancy, education, and living standards. Okay, so that, new, that uh, Human Development Index is plotted against uh, energy usage per capita. And you can see off to the far right, the United States and Norway, high living standards, you know, high life expectancy, elevated education levels, you know, we're far to the right, or far uh, up on the development index, but we consume a lot of energy per person. You can see on the opposite side, Bangladesh and Congo, where they're not quite as developed, and as a result, their energy consumption per capita is much less. So put this all together, while the circumstances vary, different, or vary from country to country, the theme is pretty clear. As an economy becomes more developed, as people become more educated, and, and more importantly, living standards rise, energy consumption increases. And so you can see that by plotting all of these countries' uh, development index against energy. So think about all of the forms and uh, ways that you consume energy every day. Transportation, heating and cooling your workplace or your home, uh, recharging your cell phone or the computers you use every day, all of the appliances that we uh, employ for our lifestyle, all of those consume energy. But that's just what you're consuming. Also take into account the energy that's consumed to deliver your food, to deliver the products that you uh, use, as well as the energy involved with uh, providing community services such as schools, uh, hospitals, uh, roadways, lights, street lights, clean water, and such. All of these things consume energy. And in the United States, if you were to look at all of the energy consumed divided by the number of people we have in the United States, on average, in the United States, we consume the equivalent of about seven, or seven gallons a day of gasoline. Now, what we've done is we've taken all different types of energy you use and converted it from an energy content basis and put it on into a, 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 a unit of measure that you can kind of relate to. So if you took your electricity and all of the different types of energy you use, you use the equivalent of about six gallons of gas a day. Or, put another way, you consume and have to recharge your cell phone battery about 27,000 times a day. And that's every single day. Now, that's just in the United States, though. If you look globally, however, <clears throat> the global average is really only about 1.7 gallons of gasoline per day. And that's primarily because of the difference between our living standards 
and living standards around the uh, around the world. Now that that doesn't seem like much, does it? 1.7 gallons of gasoline. That's not much. But remember, there's seven billion people in the world, and so simple math will tell you that. Seven billion people in the world consume 12 billion gallons of gasoline, equivalent of energy, per day. So tomorrow we're going to need another 12 billion gallons of gasoline. So let's look at our second theme, and that's that the biggest driver of energy demand through 2040, through 2040 will be gains in gross domestic product living standards and primarily in the developing world. This is really a good news story. I mean, basically what this means is you're going to have a dramatic increase in the living standards of the entire population of the world. So let's take a look at GDP and where it stood in our base year of 2014. So in 2014, global GDP was the equivalent of about $72 trillion. And as you can see, OECD, or the developing world, the developed countries, which are uh, shown in blue on the global map on the right, you know, they, they make up far more than 50% of the global gross domestic product. Okay. However, it's the China, India, and the growth countries are the countries that are going to experience the fastest rates of GDP growth. Okay, I think the U.S. GDP grows what about two percent. I think China, China this year is around seven percent, and that's considered a slowdown. Uh, they were ten plus percent for many years, so their GDP is growing much faster than we are. So these key countries that we keep track of are labeled in purple. You can see Mexico, Brazil, South Africa, Saudi Arabia, Iran, Turkey, uh, Indonesia, Thailand. Um, did I miss anybody? I think that's everybody. So where are we going to go in 2040? Well, I talked earlier about how GDP was going to grow by over 100%. And here it is. Uh, $72 trillion today. $150 trillion by 2040. But notice the seismic change in the distribution of that gross domestic product. By 2040, the OECD growing at about 2% a year will no longer be half of, or greater than half of the world's gross domestic product. In fact, it's the rest of the world, China, India, key growth, key growth countries and other countries uh, that will make up greater than 50%. Uh, percent. However, it is important to remember that even by the year 2040, income levels in these developing countries will still be about 65% lower than they are here in the United States in the developing world. So even with this progress, there will still be billions of people uh, in other parts of the world that remain far below the living standards that we enjoy today. So as we update this outlook to start looking beyond 2040, we'll see even more of an increase in energy demand as this part of the world continues to grow uh, in future years. So we believe that this economic expansion will be the largest growth, will generate the largest growth in the middle global middle class ever experienced. In fact, the Brookings Institute estimates that the middle class, which is today about two and a half billion people, will more than double to nearly five billion people. So almost five billion, out of the 9 billion people in the world by 2040 will be middle class or even more affluent. Okay? At the same time that this middle class is growing, urbanization will also continue to increase. And the urbanization is a key uh, factor to track because as people congregate into cities, this drives a need for energy intensive construction of roads, buildings, and a huge amount of energy needed to make all of the required steel, concrete, uh, and building materials to accommodate that urbanization. So this chart shows urbanization of populations, and you'll notice how the OECD peaks uh, leading with about 85% of the population living in cities by the year 2040. Uh, but noticeable is the pace at which China urbanizes. Overall, from uh, 2010 to about 2030, 20% 20 of the population will be added in urban centers. 
That's about 300 million people, or the equivalent of adding about 15 New York cities or 30 Chicago between now and 2030. So the transition to 2030 is one of the reasons that we see continued energy growth in China. India has a relatively steady pace of urbanization, and we expect that energy demand will follow that steady pace. So as I mentioned earlier, global energy demand is expected to grow by about 25%. This chart breaks down the de that it, uh, demand increase by region of the, of the world. As you can see, almost all of the increase in energy demand is in developing countries. In fact, in blue at the bottom of the OECD, you'll actually see that our energy demand decreases. So while we're going to need 25% more energy, the countries that make up the OECD won't be demanding any more energy than they do today. All of the demand growth is in China, India, our 10 key growth countries, and the rest of the world. This also reflects the fact that energy usage is already quite widespread in OECD countries. So, I mean, you know, how many uh, refrigerators or cars you know, do people need in the United States? As we grow our economy, we're not necessarily going to add any more cars to our garages than we have today, or any more washing machines to our houses. But it's not in other areas of the world that that growth will continue. For example, in India, there's only two cars per 100 people today, versus 60 cars per 100 people in North America. So, as those economies grow, the number of cars in China and India will grow significantly, and that will drive energy demand. So, extending access to modern energy and technologies remains a significant challenge in the developing world, uh, particularly in Africa and Asia Pacific. Even today, and I find these statistics phenomenal, but even today, there's 1.2 billion people in the world that do not have access to electricity. Was it better? Is that better? I'm moving up. How's that? And there's still 2.7 billion people cooking their food with biomass fuels such as wood or charcoal because they don't have access to electricity, natural gas, or other forms of energy to cook their food. So, in a nutshell, that's the demand picture. What we want to talk about now is how economics, as well as policies, impact the types of fuel that will be used in the future to meet that demand. So we'll consider, while we, will, while we as a company and within this outlook, consider a vast uh, number of policies and economic options, today we're really going to focus on, on one primary one, and that's the policies aimed at reducing CO2 emissions because we believe that they will play an increasingly more important role in the types of energy that are used to meet energy demand in the future. So let's start with a few quotes. So as the United Nations has recognized, billions of people are impacted by energy poverty. So improving access to energy and the standards of living of all people remains a priority in many, many countries around the world. We also recognize that each nation is at a different stage of their development. So each of those countries has to consider multiple priorities as they make their choices uh, on investment decisions. But as the CEO of ExxonMobil has pointed out, we recognize that climate change poses risks that are serious enough to warrant action. And almost, we expect almost every nation to strive to reduce greenhouse gas or CO2 emissions in the future. Some of those nations already have policies that limit CO2 emissions. We expect those policies will grow stronger and more widespread over time. Uh, primarily led by OECD countries, with the developing nations such as China and India uh, gradually following along. Um, the progression of climate initiatives will vary from country to country, and it will be impacted 
Um, it'll be impacted by each country's decision on how aggressive to get or how aggressive to be at addressing climate, um, climate change balanced with their need for economic growth, competitiveness, and energy security, as well as the ability of their citizens to be able to shoulder the cost of dealing with, with uh, reducing climate uh, gases such as CO2. So we utilize, at, we utilize at ExxonMobil, we utilize a proxy. We place a dollar value on carbon dioxide. We, we do that in order to assess our um, estimate on the true cost of energy sources based on the amount of carbon dioxide they emit. Okay? So as you can see here, in our, by 2040, the countries in red, United States, Canada, all of Europe, and Australia and Japan, you know, the, the proxy cost for carbon dioxide, in other words, the, the cost to meet uh, climate um, greenhouse gas emission standards, is roughly about $80 per ton. And you can see, you know, that decreases all the way down to $20 per ton in, in, for South America and much of Asia. And then in those countries that don't have uh, economic pol or um, governmental policies addressing climate change at the moment, you know, the cost of carbon in those areas is less than $10. So one thing to note, these are proxy costs. These are, these are averages, okay? So many policies impose significantly higher costs on carbon, uh, as to, such as today's U.S. incentives uh, provided for plug-in fully electric cars. The proxy costs or the cost for those types of cars to reduce the amount of carbon dioxide that they emit is about $500 a ton. It's one of the most expensive ways to reduce carbon dioxide emissions. So addressing climate change uh, risks is critical, but so too is raising living standards for people around the world. And so the challenge is how to do both. This is one of the reasons that we believe that the world will shift towards less carbon intensive uh, mixture of energy. So as you can see here, we expect the share of the total energy uh, supply uh, for coal to decrease dramatically. Uh, it will be overtaken and replaced by cleaner fuels such as natural gas, nuclear, as well as renewables, wind, solar, and, um, and biofuels. Together, efficiency along with cleaner fuels will have a big impact on emissions. Uh, ExxonMobil sees global CO2 emissions peaking around 2030 and then ultimately starting to decline in the last decade of the outlook that we've looked at. Uh, the global turning point will be, uh, will be driven by the OECD that you can see in blue at the bottom. The OECD will uh, continue to significantly decrease emissions, declining by more than 20%. However, global emissions will continue to rise as developing nations, primarily in developing nations, due to their rapid economic growth and their current use of more carbon intensive fuels. But even in those countries such as China and India, eventually they will also start to decrease their CO2 emissions. And this, this is a very credible forecast. It's in line with the International Energy Agency's new policy scenario. They, however, show emissions to continue to grow right up to 2040. We actually think that they'll start to decline in the last 10 years of the outlook period. So let me wrap up with just one last quote. So like Bill Gates and many others in this area, we also believe that innovation and technology hold the most hope to finding solutions for managing climate change risk, while at the same time uh, advancing living standards around the world. I mean, you only need to look back uh, in history just a, a short period of time to realize you know, how much technology advancement has really uh, brought new technologies to our use. So there are many aspects of the world's energy future up upon which ExxonMobil and the IEA and others agree. And one of the keys, uh, one key area that, of that agreement is that oil will remain the number one fuel source 
uh, through 2040. And that leads us to our next, our next theme. So ExxonMobil sees global demand for oil as well as other liquid fuels rising by more than 20%. Let's take a look at what's driving that demand. As you can see, the biggest factor here is transportation. So today, over 95% of the world's transportation needs, whether it's cars, planes, trains, is met by liquid fuels. That's gasoline, diesel, jet fuel. And you can see that that share remains uh, high throughout the outlook period. And that's primarily because liquid fuels are ideally uh, suited for transportation. They're available, you know, they're readily available. There's a large distribution infrastructure already in place. And more importantly, it packs a lot of energy into a small volume. And so when you literally have to carry your fuel around in your car's fuel tank, it remains one of the most economical ways to fuel your car. However, another significant and growing source of, energy, of oil demand is the industrial sector. You can see that in the sector that I uh, am very active in, because I'm in the chemicals portion of ExxonMobil. You'll see that the, uh, as the industrial demand for liquid fuels increases, there's a fairly significant increase in the amount of that that goes to the chemical sector to make plastics and other advanced materials. And then you can see liquid uh, consumption, oil, uh, and natural gas liquids consumption in energy generation and residential co uh, commercial really are flat to down. So it's really the industrial and transportation sectors that drive oil. So let's take a look, since transportation is the largest bar on this graph, let's take a look at transportation in a little bit more detail. What's really interesting here is that the growth and demand for liquid fuels is not in the transportation sector is not going to come from cars or what we refer to as light duty vehicles. It's really coming from commercial transportation, mostly from heavy duty road vehicles such as large commercial vehicles, the 18 wheelers that you see and delivery trucks that are delivering goods. And this really, I mean, this projection really goes hand in hand with that economic growth story. So as economic growth continues and living standards uh, continue to rise, more and more people are going to order goods and they're going to acquire more goods and services. And all of those are delivered by heavy duty commercial transportation. And so that's the sector that's really going to drive transpor uh, transportation fuel needs. Um, light duty, you can see at the bottom, actually declines. Well, it's really an unprecedented decline. I mean, the, the consumption of gasoline and light duty vehicles has been increasing for decades. But we actually see that peaking and turning over and starting to decline. It's not that there's going to be fewer cars on the road. In fact, we expect the global number of cars to increase by 80%. In fact, in China, China will overtake the United States after having more light duty vehicles on the road during the outlook period. But it's actually fuel efficiency uh, that will drive that. And we'll take a look at that in more detail. So the average fuel economy of a light duty vehicle is expected to grow by 80%. So while the number of vehicles are growing by 80%, the fuel efficiency of those vehicles is also improving by about 80%. Today, it's roughly about 25 miles to the gallon. We expect by 2040 that that'll be more like 45 miles to the gallon. And you can see here where in the world back in 2008, where countries had policies in place you know, dictating how much fuel economy light duty vehicles uh, achieved. There were really only four back in 2008, the United States being one of them. And just 10 years later in 2014, more stringent standards were adopted by large countries such as the US and the EU, but more importantly, a, a number of countries around the world implemented fuel economy standards. So what this means is that about 90% of the cars today are in countries that have fuel economy standards. The net effect of these standards is that car manufacturers have to produce much more efficient vehicles. Of course, the key question everybody asks then for the transportation is, well, what type of cars will people drive in the future? Some people think the answer might be fully electric cars, like the Volt and the Leaf. 
Uh, there are very few of them on the road today, but they're getting a significant amount of press time. But let's take a look at comparing the internal combustion engine and the electric car. Vast majority of the cars on the road today are conventional internal combustion vehicles, and, and for many reasons. One, the primary drivers, they are the lowest cost transportation solution um, for most, almost all consumers. They're easy to use. You can find gasoline at just about every single uh, intersection. Uh, it's easy, quick, and easy to fuel up. You can fill up your car in a matter of minutes, and you can drive your car hundreds of miles before you have to stop and refuel again. Now compare that to electric cars. Technically, they are more efficient, but they come at a very high cost, and consumers have to deal with only being able to drive them a very limited range, and then they've got to plug them in and wait hours for them to recharge. Um, these cars are especially attractive because of the concept or the idea that they have zero emissions. You have to remember that's zero tailpipe emissions. While the car itself may not have any emissions as you're driving the car, you have to take into consideration all of the CO2 emissions generated by the power companies producing the electricity that's being consumed to charge that car. So while the car itself is technically emitting no emissions, it's still contributing to carbon dioxide emissions through the production of the electricity needed to recharge that car. We pay attention to, as an oil company, we pay attention uh, to the development of electric, electric car technology very closely. And honestly, we don't see, and without a significant breakthrough in the technology of the battery in those cars, uh, we don't see these cars being a very attractive option in the near future. Uh, and we also don't see that breakthrough on the horizon. May come someday, we just don't see it at the moment. Where we do see a, a significant growth is in hybrids. And by hybrids, we're referring to cars that have a combination of an internal combustion engine and a small electric motor. The best example today is the Toyota Prius. Okay? It's a hybrid. It's not fully electric. It's not fully gasoline. It's a combination of the two. And it gets about 50 miles to the gallon. So this is a, a very attractive compromise solution because it ne meets the needs of both future consumers who don't want to give up range and convenience of putting gas in their car, but it also meets um, you know, the desires of policymakers by significantly reducing uh, the amount of pollu or CO2 emissions that the car is emitting. So lastly, I want to emphasize that we do consider not just electric, internal combustion, and hybrid. I mean, we look at all types of future vehicle technologies, including natural gas and fuel cell vehicles, where you fuel the car with hydrogen and then chemically convert it to electricity on board. Um, we even consider public transportation. We monitor all of these uh, fuel options in order to draw a realistic view, vision of the future. So all things considered, this is where we expect the global light duty fleet to be headed uh, between now and 2040. The total number of vehicles will rise by about 80 percent to more than 1.7 billion cars in the world. And by 2025, we expect China to surpass the United States with the most cars. But as you can see, we expect hybrid vehicles to become much more commonplace. In fact, by 2040, we expect about 25% of the cars uh, to be hybrid cars. You'll see some growth in fully electric and alternative vehicles but really their, their penetration is limited because of practical considerations. So now, we've been talking a lot about demand. Let's shift to the supply side for liquids. We expect the supply to grow by about 20%, reading, reaching 112 million barrels a day of oil equivalent. Uh, this chart shows the supply sources. Um, you can see OPEC at the bottom, as well as supply from non-OPEC countries. They're expected to grow over the outlook period with North America, Saudi Arabia, Russia, and Iraq, uh, providing around half of the world's oil supply. 
On the right, we see growth supplies by type, starting first with conventional oil for OPEC and non-OPEC countries, followed by NGLs, or natural gas liquids. These are liquids that are co-produced when we produce natural gas. And then tight oil, deep water, oil sands, and other. And those last four categories are really driven by technology advancement. So tight oil, the ability to produce tight oil, a combination of horizontal drilling and hydraulic fracturing, has dramatically increased our ability to recover oil from tight shale formations. Deep water, also a technology story. With the advancement of technology and materials, we're able to go deeper and deeper into the ocean and drill deeper and deeper into the, into the earth to develop uh, more and more oil out of deep, uh, deep water. So fundamentally, these uh, technologies have led to our current age of abundance, which is really the story behind today's low oil prices. It's an oversupply. These technologies have developed uh, to the point where they're now producing more oil than is demanded, and so we're stockpiling oil, and oil is uh, at a low. Demand will pick up, drilling will slow down, producers will slow down, eventually oil prices will turn around. Um, but this is, again, we think this is a short-term phenomenon. But what's interesting here is if you kind of eyeball the, uh, the bars for OPEC and non-OPEC, you'll notice that conventional crude oil stays roughly flat, doesn't really grow. All of the growth in oil production will be in NGLs as well as these technology stories, tight oil and deep water. So trade is very important because the availability of oil and liquid fuels is not always in the same place that the demand is at. So trade is a critical importance to this, to the supply story. The world has more than enough resources but it's not always in the right place, so it's got to be moved around the world. So this chart shows trade balances by region. So the blue bar is how much of that region's demand is met by local production. The green bars illustrate those areas where they are able to produce more than they need locally, and they're a net exporter of oil. Whereas the red bars mean that they need much more than they are able to produce, and so they uh, import. What's really interesting about this chart is that by, I don't know, about 2022, somewhere in the 20, just past 2020, North America goes from being a net oil importer to a net oil exporter. And that's really the only region where you see that shift from import to export. And all of the other regions that stay pretty much the same. I mean, their demands change, but Europe and Asia Pacific who are currently you know, very heavy importers will continue to be very heavy importers. Middle East, Russia, who are currently very heavy exporters, they're going to, their demand will go up, but they're going to continue to be very significant exporters of oil. Africa actually will get close to balance, we believe, by the year 2040. So as I mentioned earlier, natural gas is expected to grow more than any other energy source. In fact, about 40% of the total increase in global energy will be met by natural gas. It's always been a reliable fuel, but it's relatively low uh, carbon content, and the recent breakthroughs in unconventional gas uh, production are lifting gas to a new level of, of prominence uh, in, on the energy stage. And by 2040, we expect natural gas will surpass coal to become the second largest source of energy. And this is where we see natural gas demand growing in four primary sectors. You can see industrial and electricity generation are the two key areas that will grow the demand for natural gas. Uh, the industrial sector will accounts for about one-third, uh, and the rest of the growth is divided between residential, commercial, and transportation. And about half of the growth will be in electricity generation or will be needed by electricity generation. So since electricity generation has a significant influence on rising gas demand, let's take a look at what drives the growth in electricity demand. This chart so shows which sectors drive about two-thirds of the growth in electricity. And you can see there's growth in the industrial area, but primarily in the residential and commercial area. 
And then this, this chart shows you where that growth will take place. And you can see the significant increase in electricity demand in China. I mean, everybody's growing, but the United States and the European members of the OECD are only growing slightly. It's primarily China, India, and those 10 key growth countries that I outlined earlier that will drive the significant increase in electricity demand. So the key question for the outlook is, with the world needing two-thirds more electricity, what fuels will be used to generate that electricity? And so this chart shows you the breakdown of what types of fuel are used to generate an increasing demand for electricity or, or power generation. And as you can see, between 2000 and 2040, we see uh, you know, there's not a lot of oil going into electricity generation. There's a significant amount of coal, but we actually expect the amount of coal used for electricity generation to peak around 2030 and actually start to decrease. It's really natural gas and nuclear are the big growth areas. So while coal continues to grow a little bit, the, the coal demand won't be in the OECD. So these dotted lines show the portion of coal that is used for power generation in the OECD. So it's really China and um, the other uh, developing countries of the world that are driving that coal growth uh, through, the, um, through the outlook period. Wind and solar, you can see in the yellow bar there, they'll reach a combined supply of about 10% globally by 20, uh, 2040. Primarily, uh, the, the largest region uh, will be Europe. We actually think Europe will meet about 25% of its electricity needs via wind and solar by 2040. And all of, these, uh, all of this growth is driven by policies such as subsidies and mandates. Um, and, and they'll continue to grow, but remember, they're also limited by the requirement for backup power supply. Because you've still got to be able to provide electricity when the, sun is, uh, when the sun's not out or when the wind's not blowing. So they will be a contributor. There's no doubt about that. But the amount that they're able to contribute will be hampered by their need for backup power. So natural gas is the key story. So let's look at the supply of natural gas. We see the supply of natural gas growing by about 50% to over 500 bil billion cubic feet per day. About 80% of that increase will be in unconventional production, such as you know, tight, shale gas forma uh, tight shale gas formations. And you'll note that the trade of gas is also going to continue to grow. So LNG, liquefied natural gas, as well as interregional pipeline deliveries, the percentage of the global natural gas uh, trade accomplished via these two uh, transportation methods will continue to grow, will make up about 25% uh, by 2040. So just as we, th this chart will look a little familiar, but just as we did with oil, let's take a look at net trade for gas by region. And you'll notice that the story's very, very similar. So demand for natural gas will increase across pretty much all regions with the exception of Europe. And what you'll see is that just as we saw with oil, North America will become a net exporter of liquefied natural gas. Um, and then Europe, Asia, Pacific, a net importer just as they are for oil, the Middle East, uh, Russia, and Africa continue to be net exporters. So I've talked a lot about technology. I've tried to, you know, I've tried to intersperse the presentation about how technology drives a lot of the decisions we make, the types of oil, the types of fuels and sources of energy we produce, as well as demand. So I just want to finish up um, my presentation today by talking a little bit more about uh, technology, because one of the things that I haven't touched on, I've talked about where energy supplies will be demanded, what sectors, what types. I've talked about where energy supplies will come from, what sources, what regions of the, of the world, and so forth. One thing we haven't really talked about, though, um, is energy efficiency. And you can actually think of energy efficiency as probably the largest source of energy um, available. So you can see here, plotted from 1970 to where we think it's going in 2040, 
the global average energy intensity, which is essentially the BTUs of energy we consume per dollar of GDP. Basically what this shows is that technology has really driven how ef efficiently we use energy. Whether it's hybrid cars or LED light bulbs versus the old uh, internal combustion engines of the 1960s and 70s and incandescent light bulbs. I mean you can look at a, any number of appliances that are in, getting increasingly and increasingly more energy efficient. So remember I said earlier that global energy demand would grow by about 25 percent. Well that's based on these expected improvements in how efficiently we use energy. If it weren't for these efficiency improvements energy wouldn't grow by 20, energy demand wouldn't grow by 25 percent. It'd grow by about a hundred percent because it'd grow right along with GDP. Okay? In fact the cumulative amount of energy saved worldwide by achieving these energy efficiency gains is 10 times the amount of energy currently consumed by North America and Latin America. So the bottom line is technology advancements to continue this downward trend in the amount of energy per uh, GDP that we consume really is the single biggest contributor to meeting energy demand in the future. Technology also contributes to what types of fuel we use. This chart uh, looks back all the way to the mid-1800s and forward to 2040 and kind of plots the mixture of types of energy we've used. So you can look, you know, back in the mid-1800s, everything was biomass, wood, or coal. That's all there was. Then you see oil emerge on the scene, natural gas, and then in, in recent years, unconventional gas as well as hydroelectric, nuclear, and other renewables. So it's quite a dramatic shift in the types of energy that we use. And you can even see how coal is slowly decreasing in the amount uh, of its contribution to the energy mix. So to wrap up, here we summarize global demand by fuel in order of contribution to that demand. The dotted lines show the base year. For, for us, it's 20, uh, 2014. And then the bars show where uh, fuel, what types of fuel will be used in 2014. The numbers at the top of the bar show the average annual rate of increase in that type of fuel. So there's a lot of interesting things here. You can see, as I said earlier, by 2040, oil will still be the number one source of energy. But there's a big shift in the number two, number three slot. So natural gas, which is currently third by 2040, growing at about 1.6 percent per year over the time span of this outlook. That means natural gas will grow by about 50 percent, will overtake gold, uh, coal and become our number two source of energy. The other interesting story is coal. Not only is it not growing, but it's actually decreasing. Um, not by much, 0.2 percent per year, but the amount of coal consumed uh, and use for energy will, will go down. And that's primarily driven by policies and mandates around reducing the amount of CO2 uh, being released into the atmosphere. And that's really going to drive a lot of electricity generation from coal to natural gas. What's also interesting is that you'll see a significant increase in nuclear power of 2.9 percent per year, more than du almost doubling. But the fastest growing fuel source will be solar, wind, and biofuels. I mean, they're going to grow at almost 5% per year. So over the outlook period, they will grow significantly. However, they're starting at a very small base. And so even by, while they're going to grow very fast, even by 2040, they'll still be one, two, three, four, sixth uh, in the, uh, overall in the type of energy that, we'll, uh, that we use. So in summation, uh, there's a growing need for reliable, affordable, and cleaner types of energy. And meeting that demand across all of these different uh, types of fuel is made possible by technology and uh, is the key to growing living standards, elevating those other 2.5 billion people into the middle class, and meeting the energy demands of a growing population and growing, uh, growing economic prosperity. So that's it. That's 
my discussion. You can find, if you're interested, you can find this entire package online at our website. And I'd like to open it up for any questions. Yes? I'm going to speak in tongues. <laughs> so, we might, uh, I see, I see the, the point of predicting till 2004. However, it did not address yet the population is going to grow to 9 billion people. Uh, the standard of living in underdeveloped countries is not improving, nor it will improve, it will worsen as we see it currently. And believe it or not, all in producing countries, Libya, Iraq, Saudi Arabia. The thing is, geopolitics, does this prediction look like that? You know, I honestly don't know how much geopolitical uh, issues influence this outlook. I'm sure they're considered to some degree, but they're extremely difficult to predict. Um, I mean, the changes in some of the Middle Eastern countries just in the last two to three years, and that's very hard to predict on what will happen between now and 2040. Overall, while some individual countries may or may not achieve their standard of living increases, over as a as a as a as a globe, we still expect a significant improvement in living standards. Remember, the primary drivers here are India, China, Mexico, South America, and so forth. So there are you can still point out individual countries that may not achieve those living standard improvements. But as a whole, on a macro scale, we still expect to see that significant increase in gross domestic product, raising of living standards, and ultimately demand for energy. Geopolitical, you know, it's very hard to, how do you predict, you know, what one country's leader will do between now and 2040? And those leaders change out, you know. So it, it, I see your point. It definitely has. It, it definitely is a factor, but it's extremely difficult to predict. Any other questions? Okay. Thank you very much for your time. Uh, really appreciate coming to talk to you today and hope you enjoy the rest of your meeting. Good morning, everybody. How are you this morning? Yeah, I can tell you a good group this morning. Good to see you. You're going to get a double dose, aren't you? You, you are going to get a double dose. He was uh, in our charter school presentation, and I did this piece about the importance of emergency operations planning. Uh, my name is E. Cummett Burley, and I'm the director for the Center for Safe and Secure Schools. And just quickly, a little quick introduction about my background. I am a 30-year educator, and I started out in the classroom and ended up in the boardroom. At the end of my career, I spent six and a half years as a superintendent of schools. And uh, I've always worked with diverse student populations. I loved every minute of it. And this role has really given me an opportunity to stay connected with and support schools and children, which is the bottom line while we're all here. Uh, as you know, we are in a support function. Would you agree? We're there to facilitate and what's happening with kids. And our goal is, is to help them be successful. And sometimes I know uh, as a superintendent, I had to work with my CFO to remind her that's why we're there. We're there to help them, not throw roadblocks in their way when they need help and support. Would you agree? Absolutely. So today we're going to talk about the importance of uh, emergency planning. Why is that important to you as uh, people who handle money a lot? Because if you don't have a plan for emergencies, it can come back to bite you. Would you agree? Okay, how many of you have some responsibilities over operations or maintenance you deal with? Anything to do with operations, facilities? Anything? Few of you? Okay, we've got a few here, okay? So this topic is going to kind of lend itself to those areas because emergency planning is very important today, particularly in the society we're currently living in. I think I have, I have never seen uh, so much going on that's happening in America and around the world that is impacting our schools. 
uh, active shooter incidents, for, uh, for, uh, for example, uh, the ISIS threat and uh, their ability to radicalize people from uh, thousands of miles away, uh, the incident in San Bernardino. So we're going to talk a little bit about that today, but I want to introduce you to the Center for Safe and Secure Schools real quickly. Uh, our goal is to support you, support the superintendents. We were created in 1999 at the request of superintendents in Harris County to support their efforts to maintain learning environments that are safe and secure, where teachers could teach and students could learn. And they ask us to have that as our focus. So we pledge to provide solutions to challenges that schools face every day in the area of trying to secure their learning envir environments and make them conducive for students performing at their best. And our vision is that we want to be your first choice. First place you come when you think about safety and security, how can I get information and training for my staff in this area? We want you to think about us, that's our vision. So we're working hard to do that. <clears throat> Some of our core beliefs, one of the things that as a superintendent, I always tell uh, teachers and others administrators that good discipline starts with good instruction. And if the kids are engaged and uh, they feel like the learning is meaningful and relevant, it cuts down on a lot of problems. So we also believe that you need to, to teach the behavior you want kids to demonstrate. You can't assume that they're going to come to the table with all the proper behavior and emotional etiquettes and protocols in place. They just don't. I've worked with the group that uh, we constantly had to work on keeping our environment safe and secure, and we had to teach them the behavior we expected them to demonstrate. So this is some of our core beliefs as a division here. Today, what I hope to accomplish with you is that I wanna emphasize that emergency management planning is an ongoing process and not a one-time event. Because things are constantly evolving in society today, in our community and in the area, you have to constantly be uh, uh, improving and enhancing your emergency management plan. Secondly, this has to become a part of your organizational culture. Many times as administrators, I was a building principal, middle school principal, I was a high school assistant principal, and many times emergency planning came as an afterthought. We were more focused on getting student achievement up, meeting the requirements of the accountability system, and sometimes safety and security was a second thought until what? Something happened. And it really needs to be on your plate and on your radar screen all the time. So it has to become a part of your culture. I um, went to and know an excellent uh, principal at um, one of the districts here that we serve and uh, she has really has this down about building safety into the culture. When you go into her school, very orderly, quiet, she greets all of her students every day, but one of the things she tells them, look, she said, kids, it's my job as principal and as a staff to keep you safe, but it's your job to help us, Bill, keep you safe. And she and the kids will tell you that. It's my job to keep you safe, but it's your job to help me keep you safe. And that's what I tell our staff here. We're doing safety orientations with our staff right now. And what we're telling them, look, by board policy, the Center for Safe and Secure School is responsible for developing this emergency operations plan, but it's no good if you don't implement it, if you don't really take it seriously and become a part of the solution. So we tell them it's our job to keep you safe, but it's your job to help us keep you safe. Let me t show you a, a little video here. Hopefully it will work. All right, we're gonna proceed on. We'll come back to run, hide, fight. And I think that one will be a, here's some challenges to emergency planning that uh, you run into creating a safe post 9-11 and after Sandy Hook Elementary incident. First is finding the time and resources. Having people being able to sit down with your staffs at your campus level and do the kind of planning that you need to do. It's a collaborative effort. I always tell um, people in our presentations that you can't do this planning in a vacuum. 
You've got to have a cross-section of people there from dis different disciplines who are sitting there planning with you. The other piece is creating a culture of safety requires ownership by all who are working in the learning community. How do you create ownership? Can somebody tell me? How do you create ownership? You've got initiative, you're a CFO, you're trying to, let's say, zero-based budgeting. You're trying to get people on board with that. How do you get them, to, how do you get the buy-in? You, you use a group of people to participate in decision-making. All right, anybody else? You find leaders. You find leaders, you find leaders that, lead. that will lead. It is, that's right, you're exactly right. And it's the same with safety planning and emergency planning. You've got to get people involved in the whole process, starting with the planning and have a cross-functional group of people that are working with you uh, so that they can have buy-in. It won't work. So I hope you'll accept the challenge to help your people at your building find the time and provide them with the resources that they need. What does the law say? The law says in chapter 37, 108, that every three years you have to have a safety audit conducted of all your facilities, instructional and non-instructional. All right, also, they envision the process being ongoing. And I mentioned the cross-functional teams. You gotta have a safety committee at your buildings and also at the district level, you should have a safety committee that is involved in planning and in uh, developing a emergency operations plan. Okay, we were talking about some of the requirements that uh, the state uh, wants you to have in your emergency plan. Uh, it has to be a multi-hazard emergency plan. In other words, it's gotta cover multiple incidents, probably particularly those that are most likely to happen in your area based in your, on your situation in that multi-hazard plan. Employee training is important, it's required. And that's one of the things that we're seeing a lot of is that when we go to a building to do a safety audit, we talk to the principals at the building and we ask them, have their safety committee been, has it been selected, designated, have they been trained, and it's lacking. And I think you as central office personnel are gonna have to have, have them help with that and provide a way for them to get that training and service. We have a solution in the, your uh, brochure there called ERIP that has the training module that you can uh, get that is already built in to do some of the training that's required. You have to report the audit results to your board of education. It's not open to the public, but you do have to report it to your board and you can also use it for internal purposes. Other requirements in the plan, badging policy. A badging policy. One of the things that we do when we do a safety audit is that we go around your building, the perimeter, and try to gain access into the building to see if you have some type of protocol in place to prevent an intruder from getting into your building. One time we were doing an audit at a school district in the, in the area and we knocked on the door and the custodian came and we asked her to let us in and she did. So what that means is that your custodians have to be a part of the process. And we forget that your cafeteria workers, sometimes you don't think of that. What kind of uh, safety plan do you have for kids who are in the auditorium? Or if you have an emergency and they're in the gym or in the cafeteria, do you have a plan for that? What about at your stadium? Do you have a safety protocol for if something happens at your stadium? Um, one of the uh, emergency operations centers is doing a workshop and it's just working on just that, working on developing plans for when you're in large areas or outdoor areas. So that's important. Badging policy, role specific, and it needs to be based on NIMS and the incident management and the incident command system. Uh, NIMS is the National Incident Management System. It was put in place by George Bush when he was president, but it gives you a way for everybody to speak the same language. The framework is used by first responders and everybody that comes to an incident or accident is familiar with that particular framework. Aerials of your facility. If you had a first responders, if they, when they come, would they have access to your floor plans? If you had an active shooter hostage situation, could first responders get access to your floor plans easily? And uh, <clears throat> more and more uh, school districts are doing aerials of their facilities. Drills and exercises. 
How many of you do drills and exercises at your non-instructional facilities, at your maintenance, okay, at your central office? Many times we find that sometimes school uh, district and district official, officials overlook the non-instructional facilities, but that is critical. Parent-child reunification plans. There was an incident that happened last year at one of the districts in our area where a student was stabbed to death and kids, came, the parents came up, of course, because kids were uh, texting them and saying, look, something's going on, we're on lockdown. But one of the things that came out of that whole ordeal was the lack of a parent reunification plan, a lack of a plan for communicating to parents what was going on. And that's, that's important that you have that. Emergency response team list. How many of you have an emergency kit in every classroom for your teachers? Someone said yes over here, someone else. I saw a hand go up. You should have that. They should have what they need in case of an emergency, an intruder. In that kit, it may be things like something to put under their doors to let, let you know that they're okay, something in some way to communicate with you. Uh, give them what they need to, in order for them to uh, have a uh, plan of action in case of an emergency. Joint planning meetings with your, uh, with your local emergency management planners. How many of you have had a meeting with your first responders, police? If you are served by, let's say, a sheriff's office or the county law enforcement, you uh, outsource your security. How many of you have sat down and gone over and developed your plan with them? Staff training, written and documented. Staff members have copies of the emergency plan. You'd be surprised we have gone to sites where all the people had not seen the emergency operations plan and we're not familiar with it. What about primary and an alternate site? Something happens at your facility where it's shut down, you've got to evacuate everybody. Let me give you an example. As a superintendent, we had a bomb threat. It was in the middle of winter, and uh, we had to, what, dump the kids outside? Of course, they're texting mom and dad, and they're getting excited, but we're also concerned too because it is very cold. And what we did have was an interlocal agreement with a church right across the uh, highway there, 1765, and we were able to get buses in and take them over to that facility. So do you have alternate sites for your facilities? That should be a part of your emergency operations plan is an alternate uh, evacuation site. Routes and rallying points should avoid hazards. When first responders come, you don't want a lot of people in their way. You, your routes and evacuation and rallying points should be away from the area where the incident is occurring. The Texas Center for School Safety is a place where you're gonna be sending your safety audits when they're completed. These are some of the recommendations that they had that came out of their study of the uh, safety audit information that was sent to them. First, it says school districts should engage in collaborative preparedness. So obviously, it's not happening to the extent that they think it should. Uh, so that is one area that needs to be improved. Other areas said school districts should audit and develop emergency plans for non-instructional facilities, conduct drills at both your instructional and non-instructional facilities. School districts should address recovery in the district multi-hazard emergency operations planning. So those are some recommendations from the Texas School Safety Center for improving your emergency operations plans. I call this particular pre presentation the four P's of effective emergency planning. Prepare, plan, prepare, practice, and perform. And I just want to spend a couple of minutes talking about your plan. These are some uh, characteristics that should be in your plan, the, some components of it. Uh, when we look at your plan and review it as a center, we're going to look for all multi-hazards plan. Does it cover different incidents that could possibly happen? 
Is it based on the National Incident Management System? Does it do four things? A good emergency operations plan should try to prevent things from happening, reduce the possibility or mitigate things from happening, and then prepare your people in the event you have an emergency, because I think you all would agree that emergencies, particularly at the school site, will happen. And then how do you want them to respond when the emergency occurs? And then the last part of that plan should have some kind of protocol for recovery. How are you gonna get things back to running normally? Uh, in one of the Fort Bend schools, they had a uh, suicide murder incident. And of course, they sent grief counselors to that school and because it, it was impacted by the kids, but that has to be, of course, a part of your plan. Identify critical members. Do you have a safety committee? Who's on your emergency response team? Who's on your ERT team? What about your incident command system team? Do you have that set up? Your plan should outline roles and responsibilities. What is the administrator's responsibility in emergency? Staff, your teachers, your students. All that should be kind of outlined in the emergency. When we talk about mitigating an emergency, these are some things to take in mind. Number one, know the strengths and weaknesses of your facility, your district. Uh, as a building principal, how many of you were principals before you went to central office? I see one, okay. What did you do on a regular basis at your building to make sure things were going well? well I, checked, I checked with people, we had, we had drills all the time. Uh, you know, I, when we had drills, I paid attention to what the students did to see if people were having to tell them what to do or they already knew. Yes. Uh, and then after, after our drills, when we did something different after, besides the fire drill, we would always meet afterwards, talk about what went well, what didn't go well, what we needed to change. Yes. And so I was saying, and you bet you got your MBA degree, right? <laughs> yeah. Right. Yeah, you got that management by walking around. And that's what good principals and administrators do. And I would encourage you as central office people, get out of your office. Go see what's happening at your buildings. Even if this is not an area of your responsibility because there can be things that are going on or things that you can see that uh, will help you in your planning, uh, whether it's financially or whether it's dealing with emergency planning. As a superintendent, I did not want to get so far away from the action that I did not know what was going on. I had to rely on my central office people to tell me what's going on. I didn't think that was the kind of leadership style I wanted. I wanted to know what was going on at my buildings, in my classroom. So I got out and moved around. Know the safety and security issues that may exist in the community. Everybody's community is different. Some are affluent, some may be low income, high poverty, and they all bring with them certain issues. Affluent school districts, as a matter of fact, the data show that affluent school districts and uh, those that are kind of rural have a high incidence of active shooters. Did you know that? That's right. You don't see very many of them happening in the inner city. Doesn't happen for whatever reasons. It happens in rural, kind of suburban, isolated areas. High incident of active, so you need to know that. You know, what does your community, uh, what are some issues in your community that end up landing in your, your schools? Uh, we knew that on the weekend, if something happened in the weekend, guess what? It might show back up Monday. We might have some fights going on in the building because something happened on the weekend in the community. We talked a little bit about the importance of joining with your local leaders and community leaders. When we had Hurricane Ike hit, hit us in that area, we would go down to the uh, city officials, to the mayor's office, and we'd actually sit down and listen to the National Weather Service. I see you shake, shaking your head because you probably have done that or you had your superintendent do that, but we had to work closely with our city leaders so that we could get accurate information so that we could know how to respond and, and what information we needed to send out to our parents and to our students. Communication, let me focus on that a minute. Big issue. In Hurricane Ike, for example, cell towers were gone. We couldn't use cell phones. We were out for two weeks. No school. Couldn't really communicate. So what we did here at the center to assist you, we gave you two-way radios. Your, uh, 
you're a, a person who is a representative here to the center. We gave everybody two-way radios. How are you going to communicate in the event of a tornado or some type of hurricane activity that knocks out your cell towers? So how are you going to communicate to your people? You're going to do calling trees. We have what we call a safe schools alert notification system here and the districts that are members of the center uh, have that as a benefit and that particular they can go on that particular website and put in school closing and status information so it's a great system parents can access it from the outside and find out what's going on in their school and their school district preparing let's talk about how do you prepare your people at the building level right now here at Harris County we're doing safety orientations. We have close to a thousand employees and we are, we have uh, 41, for example, adult ed sites and we're literally going out and giving safety orientations to all of our personnel because we value safety here. Uh, training critical members, we have a safety committee that meets quarterly here and we're talking about we have reports from uh, the business office, risk management comes to that meeting she tells us about accidents that may have happened or occurred with employees. We get a report from our facilities uh, person. So it's a very informative meeting, but it's to keep us abreast of what's going on from a safety standpoint. Ensure materials, equipment, and emergency operations plans have been disseminated and they have been vetted. And if you did a good job of planning, as the gentleman said in the back, involve your people in the planning process, you're going to have a pretty good plan that is going to be pretty receptive by your people. Once again, the part of preparing, you've got to get those first responders there. I would venture to say that if I took a survey here, most of us have not met with those first responders. It's just not something that we typically do, but you really do need to sit down and talk with your first responders, have your principals, uh, have their first responders come. Team effort, we work together, everybody achieves more when we work as a team. Uh, other preparedness suggestions. What have you done already? Build on what you've done. Don't throw the baby out with the uh, bathwater, so to speak. You may have a good plan in place, but can you enhance it? Can you improve it? I talked with you about looking at your community and determining what incidents have a high likelihood of happening. It is required by law that if you're within a thousand feet of a railroad or a rail, railroad tracks, you've got to have a plan in place for that. Uh, if you live near what we call the smokestack districts, Laporte, Deer Park, I'm sure they have something in place for chemical releases. We had to have it because we were close to refineries and chemical releases was a big issue. So we had to make sure we had something to address that in our plan. Let's talk about practicing. Why is practicing important? Um, one of them is to ensure effectiveness, efficacy. Uh, if you don't, if you have a plan but you never practice it, like the gentleman said in the back, then your people are not going to know what to do when an actual emergency does happen or take place. Uh, we know people do fire drills or most of our schools because it's required to do one a month. But what about some of the other drills? Lockdown, reverse evacuation drills. How many of you know what that is? Reverse evacuation drill. One person in the back, for example, if you have kids outside on the playground, chemical release, something happens where a train derails that has hazardous material on board, you've got to get the kids back inside and in a safe way. Enhanced coordination and effort. When you practice, your people are going to be able to work together, not in confusion. Uh, can you imagine an active shooter in a building and people scrambling? Uh, in the Columbine situation, they actually went into the cafeteria. Kids were literally running, and it was chaotic in that situation. Guys, you've got to practice. And a lot of times, principals are busy. Uh, this gets left out. They'll do the fire drills because they're required. But the other drills, the lockdown drills, shelter in place, you've got to work with them to make sure that those drills are taking place 
Practice is going to also, you're going to find out if you have omissions and bugs and loopholes in your plan. You don't know if something is faulty or not up to par until you actually put it through some kind of scenario. Galena Pro, uh, uh, Park, rather, ISD, I want to give them some compliment. Uh, Chief Clements out there, they did a full-blown um, exercise involving their first responders. They actually created an incident and had everybody uh, alerted to it. They had to notify their parents, students, that they were going to do this. But they actually had a live scenario where they had an emergency take place that required first responders to come. And they were able to see on a large scale how their people would react. It's going to build confidence. So practice makes perfect, but practice also saves lives. Finally, if you've done all the other three Ps, you've got a good plan, you've prepared them, you've practiced, then you're ready to perform with confidence, conciseness. The information uh, concerning active shooters, the FBI did a study in 2013 of 160 active shooter incidents. And here's what they found out, that those incidents usually take place and end within two to five minutes. And they said in most cases, first responders, by the time they got there, the incident was already finished. So it's important to practice because the time will save lives. Also, they found out that 70% of the active shooter incidents happen in a place of commerce or business or in an educational setting. So educational institutions and settings have a high propensity for active shooter incidents. That's what the data seems to suggest. So if you're gonna walk the walk and be able to talk the talk, You've got to put in the effort, guys, and not overlook this important area. Finally, that gets to uh, responding is a part of that performing process. Expect to be surprised. Uh, even though you, you prepare, you practice, situations happen. As a building principal, we knew that fights occur, something could happen uh, unexpectedly, and you have to react to it. But what a plan and practicing that plan does it helps you to respond more confidently, more with clarity and conciseness. Um, I'm gonna try to see if we can. This particular lady, I'll set the stage for you. She was a teacher. Go back. In uh, Virginia. And one of her students came into the classroom with a gun and held the classmates and her hostage. But because evidently someone had worked with her. Police in Northern West Virginia say a 14 year old boy is in custody after allegedly holding a teacher and 29 students hostage. The student took a pistol into a high school classroom on Tuesday afternoon. To a situation with a, a juvenile subject in a classroom with a gun. Uh, several officers responded, many first responders were on scene throughout the event. Uh, I'd like to start by thanking all the educators who were on scene. They did an, an awesome job of evacuating the facility. School officials say the teacher did a miraculous job keeping the student calm. Authorities say the teacher convinced the boy not to let other students enter the room when they came for the next class. Those students alerted school officials about the situation. The town police chief negotiated with the boy. And ultimately were able to remove hostages from the classroom and subsequent to that were able to talk to the juvenile subject inside and have him surrender without incident. Nobody was hurt. Police did not identify the 14-year-old student. A prosecutor says he could face charges. Sandy Kozell, The Associated Press. So. Do you think possibly they had done some practice there? I think so. So um, the point that I'm trying to leave with you, if you go away with anything, is don't take emergency planning for granted. That is being done at your campuses. You have to have some type of system and process in place to ensure that it takes place and that it's done. We have a system uh, called ERIP 
where you can actually look at a dashboard and know exactly where your schools are in terms of emergency planning. Uh, recovery, important part of the emergency planning process. How are you going to get your schools up and back to running again or get up, you know, back up to speed as quickly as possible? Uh, one of the things we tell you in, in recovery, particularly where you're dealing with death or suicide of one of the students, maybe a death of the staff, is to take your time in this process. Make sure you spend time making sure everyone is back up to speed and is ready to get going again. Then some other thoughts is after every incident, we suggest you have and do a what is called a after action review, after action report, where you sit down, as the gentleman said in the back, sit down with your staff, whether it's at central office, central office working with the campus uh, personnel, and talk about what happened. I'm sure in that incident where the kid was stabbed, a lot of things happened. Some people lost their jobs uh, behind that incident, but they did a lot of thinking about how we can secure our schools. They actually shut down for a while, put in um, metal detectors at all their schools, at the secondary level anyway, and they immediately had to do something to regain the confidence of the public. Once you lose public confidence and they see that your stuff is not together, it really hurts. It takes a long time to regain that trust. So don't overlook this area because it'll hurt you in the pocketbook in the long run because you're going to lose kids. They're going to leave. Finally, revise and update. This cycle is important. You develop your plan, an incident occurs, you respond to the crisis, you evaluate how you responded, then you go back and look at your plan and revise and update it. And that's kind of the, the cycle, the process of planning and also evaluating and then updating. It should be a continuous improvement process. So that's my story today. Uh, if we can help you in any way, we do safety audits that are required by the state. We do quite a few around the state. We also do training. If you look in your brochure here, we've got some tremendous training coming up uh, on restorative justice. We've got a flyer in the uh, brochure that you have, the folder that you have that talks about that. That is in March, three-day training for your uh, all level of, of uh, personnel at the campus level and at central office. Also, NIMS training, which is important to have this 300 certification training. We're going to make that available to you. Uh, we don't charge for it if you're a member of the center. Uh, we also having uh, Dan Corum, who has written a couple of great books. Uh, he's done one on a study of active shooter traits, or what he calls random actor traits. And he talks to you about how to develop campuses and classrooms and learning environments where it cuts down on the incidence of violence and the possibility of an active shooter incident happening. Uh, so, kind of, that's my story. Thank you so much for your time today. You've been a great audience. It's been my pleasure. Uh, so my name is Danny Runnels. I'm the public sector account manager for Sprint here in Houston. I manage all of the education accounts across the Houston market. I brought in Scott Bennett from um, Atlanta, and he's going to do the presentation this morning. I appreciate your time. All right, so thank you. Welcome. Uh, if I see biscuits starting to fly at me, I will use that as an indicator that I need to hurry up. Uh, we're going to talk about really two or three types of solutions that are built for K-12. One of them is also uh, used a lot for libraries. We're going to, you guys are obviously extremely familiar with the term one-to-one. -one. Um, when you talk about one-to-one, -one, there's really, from a kind of a network perspective, there's three different pieces of it. What you need physically on your campus, maybe what you need to c keep the kids connected on a bus once they've left the campus and go home, and then connectivity at home. It's really those three different pieces that we'll talk about. So for us, you see the term uh, K-12 Campus Connect, Wireless Campus Manager, and then what we call Off-Campus Connectivity. So if we get into it, those are the three pieces is on-campus. Wireless Campus Manager is a brand that we built with Danny in, um, about three or four years ago. It's really an IT toolbox. If you're in a very large district and you have 80 IT people, Everything I talk about Wireless Campus Manager, they tend to already have. 
If you're in smaller districts, when you start talking about MDMs and SIPA filters and staging and kitting logistics, you may not have all that stuff built. So that's wireless campus manager. Off-campus network connectivity, that is simply, do all of your students have connectivity at home? The general answer is no, not everybody, but what is that percentage who does it? Is it 2%, is it 20, is it 40? Filling in that gap is the last piece of off-campus network. So this is an on-campus network. Sprint builds a managed Wi-Fi network specifically for you. So Danny has a new, really literally new network, a macro network called LTE Plus. So whenever you're accessing it out and you see a tower, that's a technology called LTE Plus. Great technology, super fast, but everyone has campuses where you can't get outside signal all the way into a building. So Wi-Fi is usually what most, the vast majority of schools rely on to provide connectivity to their students. This piece, us providing that, is always a subset. It's the second piece, the first thing, the most important thing by far is your curriculum strategy. We don't trump that. We actually kind of kick the tires on maybe trying to help. And the reality is there is no, at, in any shape or form, one size fits all curriculum strategy. I go throughout the country and you guys don't do Common Core. Most of the rest of the country does. And there's a lot of conversation and argument and complaining about Common Core with park assessments and all of that. The way I view it is Common Core is intended to be a framework. And what, what you put on that framework is up to the local community. So I go through the curriculum piece only to say that this is a subset. Not all curriculum strategies are created equal. Is anyone doing Khan Academy videos? When I say Khan Academy, do you all know what that is? So Khan Academy, that's pretty video intensive. Who, uh, who's using Edmodo as an LMS? Anybody using Edmodo? What LMS are you guys using? Blackboard, Desire to Learn, there's a bunch of them. But in LMS, if that's 90% of why you use digital technology in your schools, that's a different impact on the network than if you've done Khan Academy or YouTube.edu. Uh, is everyone, I should say everyone, who's doing uh, GAF, Google Apps for Education? Anybody yet? So they have one called Classroom. A lot of people are using Google because they've got it all embedded, it's all in the cloud. The device is a lower cost. But all of those things are wrapped up in your specific curriculum. So what you need in network is a function of that. But I will come in, this was, we started this three years ago. This was really different. This was, and we'll talk about E-Rate for a second. This solution predated the new E-Rate changes. So it used to be priority one, priority two. Well now it's category one, category two. But there is a really important systemic change in E-Rate, right? You don't really get reimbursement, or your reimbursement for traditional cellular is going down 20% year over year. I think this next coming year you'll be at 40, either 40 or 60% reimbursement. So the model's changed. And there's now a focus on what? The backhaul coming into your building and actually the CapEx, buying a Cisco router, buying a controller, buying the cabling and providing that. We do that in a managed service approach, which is e it's category two. So it is something that you can get reimbursement on. I, again, when I'm in Atlanta, Fulton County, they don't look to us for this because they have ADIT guys. They go, look, I've already bought, and I'm making up a number, 2,000, 3,000 Cisco access points. I don't need this from you. But if you have not already done that, and you know your curriculum strategy well enough, to say, now I'm ready for network, that's the next piece. I have to define curriculum strategy first. Based upon what that is, now I need network. Just view me as an option. This is never, ever a rip and replace. It's usually one of the very first questions I get. Well, I already have some stuff. Are you telling me I need to take it all out? The answer would always be never. The rule is, however much pipe or network you have, you will need more. Danny and I have been doing this for a long time. We, running networks, number one, is tough, but what you see from a data percentage perspective 
is that the data needs to go up always. They never go down. It's kind of like a finger in the dike, right? Once you take it out, you can't put it back in. Not to quote our competitors, but uh, there was an article um, about AT&T and 5G. You're starting here, 5G. Um, anyone wants to guess how, what percentage increase in data usage AT&T has seen since the iPhone? What percentage? 50% increase? 200% increase? 150,000 percent increase in data on their network since the iPhone. I mean, just think about that, 150,000 percent increase. So we'll never rip and replace is what I'm driving at. If you've got a network, you need to keep it and run it. You just need to augment, you need to keep adding. That's what we do in this solution. A couple of specifics, I always get, that's one question. Next question I get is, I cache some videos. I have local printers, I have local videos, and I'm not always calling out to the internet. Can you get to that? Yes, I can. So that's part of our onboarding process. So we can provide any device that's coming through our network can get to the local resources. You actually don't have to buy a new device from Danny to get this. If you already have Wi-Fi only iPads or Wi-Fi only Chromebooks, he can come in, I can come in, we can build this network to be able to support it. Any questions on this? Who all is getting CAT2 funding the upcoming year for routers and backhaul? Anybody else? All right, is that because you're not ready from a curriculum perspective? Okay. So if you're not ready, I will say, I asked that question very specifically. I sold, I won't say the district, it wasn't in Texas. We sold 2,000, I think Lenovo, I can't even remember what they were, 2,000 uh, mini laptops four years ago, program lasted less than a year. And the reason was they were not, they didn't need them. They did not know what their curriculum strategy was. It was a, it wasn't an expensive paperweight because we subsidized it and it was, it was zero, but it was, and they just sat there and literally actually they sat in a closet for 90 days because he did not have a, a strategy. So what you will hear from me and Danny is this is cart in front of the horse unless you're curriculum, unless you're PD with teachers, all that stuff is ready, the next piece would be this. If you need the network, then you need the tools to be able to manage the devices and processes and software that's on the network. That's what this is. So Wireless Campus Manager is a toolbox, about 10 to 12 different types of tools. Everything from an AUP, so all you guys have an AUP policy, right? Some form of an acceptable use this is when you can use your phone, this is when you can't, this is what I expect you to do with it. So uh, if you don't, if you need help, we do AUP, so we call that foundation. But that's the first piece. Uh, MDM, AirWatch, Sodi, Mobile Iron. These are software packages to be able to remotely manage the devices. Why does that matter? Well, if you have uh, kindergarten teachers who love a certain app, there are these little simple little bubble balloon apps, right? That if you're five, they're really neat. It tells you if you know you're adding correctly. Well, if you want a new one and you've got 500 devices deployed, you want 500 devices coming back to your IT guy to download the app? So that's what MDMs are for. It's to be able to remotely do that and push down new apps, push down new policies. SIPA filters, everyone know what SIPA is? Children Internet Protection Act. You can't have a network that a child can go into inappropriate uh, websites on. So SIPA filter, so we use a company called Smoothwall, there's companies named Lightspeed, iBoss, lots of different SIPA filters. We glue all that together for districts or charter schools that don't have it already glued together. Same thing I said with Fulton. When I talked to Fulton, they go, I already have AirWatch as an MDM, I already have iBoss as a SIPA filter, I don't need these. When I go to Smaller charter schools who have no IT staff, their IT staff is actually outsourced. They don't have all this and they want this for me so they can get as close to off the shelf. It's not truly off the shelf, meaning we always have to customize for the end customer to some degree. But this is a really close first step. 
Despite the fact that the penetration rates for wireless are over 100%, meaning that there's more phones in service than there are people in the U.S. Danny and I remember when the number was probably 5%. Now it's over 100%. That does not equate to every student having broadband access at home. Those are two different things. They may have a prepaid phone from Cricket, but they don't have uh, internet service from Cox or Charter or Comcast or whoever the local cable guy is. They need the broadband access to access the tools that you deliver to them at school. I, and I have been in Texas uh, for three days this week. So we started in San Antonio, went to um, uh, Kingsville, Kingsville, and then down to McAllen, then back up here. Everybody understands that, I should say everybody, the general premise is that we want to stay connected with the students after they leave. That's part of what digital curriculum is about. It's not just about traditional learning on campus. They can continue to learn when they go off. Now, exactly what does that mean? You define it. But generally speaking, at 100,000 foot, that's part of what's going on. So I was talking with the, the um, it was actually, is it South Central San Antonio? It's one of their school districts. I think it's South Central San Antonio. He did a really good job of saying, what I don't want to have happen is we brought out all these cool tools, and we think everything is wonderful. But 40% of my kids come to class or come to school every day behind. And why? Well, because 60% have connectivity at home. So at 10 o'clock, they got on Edmodo and did not understand for their life integers and what the teacher was talking about in the morning. But at 10 o'clock at night, they all started talking about it. And they go, oh, I got it. I, I didn't understand this. The 60% who had connectivity. The kids who didn't did not see that conversation. So when they got to class at 8 o'clock, they were behind. E-rate does not pay for this at all. It is one reason that it, the adoption is more difficult. There is absolutely not a dime. E-rate up till two years ago used to pay for wireless connectivity on a bus. They considered a bus to be an extension of the, the school campus, so they allowed it. They do not anymore. So I don't know to what degree um, you guys try to advocate lo locally with your congressmen and people in D.C. When we talk to USAC and FCC and the guys who own this about off-campus connectivity, they go, we're not stupid. We understand. But we have limited funding. And you guys know this is funded with USF fees that are on your mobile. And it gets, their point is, unless someone wants to raise taxes, which no one does, the money is what it is. And right now, we want to focus on bringing in connectivity on campus. That's the first, most immediate need. We're not saying it's not important to stay connected. We're just saying we don't have the funding for it. So schools are trying to figure out this piece and the next piece on their own. And there are lots of different types of grants. And there are state grants in Texas. There are uh, more um, entrepreneurial type of grants, uh, Knight Foundation, the Walton family, to help. I said there were two, three stages. This one's in the middle. If your students are on a bus for a long time, having connectivity has some value. I met with, uh, I think it was San Antonio. Um, I don't know if, I think it was, it was South Central. He said our average ride is about 15 minutes. Then you don't need to invest in providing Wi-Fi on the bus for 15 minutes. If students are on a bus for an hour, you do. I, um, in Clingsville, his point was, I want it to uh, prevent, I'm trying to think politically how to say it, um, nonviolent activity on the bus. He, he was having discipline issues. So he was going, look, if I can get their mind on something else while they're riding, I'm not having to have a discipline issue every morning whenever buses are coming in or every afternoon when they're going out. Uh, this is, I uh, just have a picture up there. We, Danny, we physically, there was a piece of hardware called a router that we would put on the bus that would basically spit out Wi-Fi. 
So if you kind of thought the router right here to the right would be Wi-Fi, so any device a student had, their own smartphone of device that you provided them would access that router. The backhaul on this side would be on his LTE Plus network. So it's basically a mobile hotspot that goes in, in the school bus. Municipalities do this a lot. So if you ride a municipal bus, most of them have, I shouldn't say most, in large cities most of them now have Wi-Fi, that's what's happening is that there's a router that they bought from us, we're back calling it out, and there, people riding the bus get free access. This is more for students. The last piece, the third piece, is what I've alluded to, which is connectivity at home. Uh, honestly, I'm seeing libraries move faster on this than schools, and again, it kind of gets back to funding, um, not that libraries have more funding, but they can move a little bit quicker in smaller volumes. Meaning, I was in Ohio last week. Uh, Cleveland Public Library has 27 branches. If they get 20 devices per branch, that's a start for them. So, but that's 500. It's not too many school districts getting 500 out of the gate. Um, we start talking about equ um, equity issues. If I only get some, who do I give it to? What's the most equitable way to decide who do I give it to? How do I keep one campus from getting mad, or one set of parents getting mad at another set of parents because these kids got access and these kids didn't? There are lots of complexities to it. Our solution, the role we play, is similar to our campus manager. It's the execution of this deployment. What does that mean? It means things like this. Um, what SSID do you want coming out of that hotspot? So when I say hotspot, y'all know what I'm, those little hockey puck sized devices, right? So on the bus, they're bigger. On a bus, they're this big and 50 people can hit it. A hotspot, smaller hockey puck size and maybe nine people can hit it. Schools will say, all right, SSID. At home, my SSID, I never changed it. So it's like AXQIZ4772. Well, I know what that means. Schools go, I want it to say Houston ISD. So can you change that for me? Yeah, that's something I'll do. All right, what about a hotspot? Like I said, just let, they'll let nine people, anybody who sees it and knows the password can hit it. That's not what a school wants. A school may need only a gig to two gigs of data in order from a curriculum perspective for it to have value. You have no desire, or at least almost, there's no school I've talked to who wants to pay for a kid to watch the Super Bowl and the device that they handed them. So that gets into a SIPA filter that keeps them off of entertainment sites. It gets into an MDM that can kiosk the device. It's those types of things. But the point is I only need a gig to two gigs. I don't need unlimited. That's also a funding issue. Unlimited is something around 35, 40 bucks a month. School will start doing the math and go, I don't have 35 times 12 times 2,000. That, I don't have anything around that. Can you do something closer to 10 times 12 times some number? Well, if I'm talking about a gig or two gigs of data, yeah. And in a SIPA filtered world where you can't get to the Super Bowl, that makes sense. What they ask us in customization is, but hold on, that hotspot, didn't you say anyone can access it? Well, they can, but I can stage it in a way that they can't. You'll hear a term called MAC ID. It's basically a number that sits inside a device. We can put that in the hotspot and tell that hotspot that's the only device you can see. So even though when they turn on that hotspot, no one else can see it. The only thing they can see it is the iPad you gave to the student or the Chromebook that you gave to the student. So now that prevents Uncle Billy from hammering on the hotspot at 2 a.m. Those are the types of things that we get to relative to what we call onboarding and staging in order to allow you to be able to start down that path. Most schools here, are, and why I talk so much about library, they're doing it out of their libraries first. They can't really afford even at a campus level to say, well, I've done the survey and 22% of my students don't have connectivity at home. That equates to 600 for this campus. They usually go, 
I, I, even at 10, I can't afford 600 times 10 times 12 months or 24 months. So what they come back to is go, but I can get 30 to 50 for the library. And surprisingly, one of the first things that people do in that model is to say, the main intent of those 30 or 50 are for the football team, baseball team, cheerleaders, chorus, debate team, anyone who's going off campus for a school event and they don't have connectivity, I'll provide it to them. That makes a lot of sense, right? Because they go, look, I've built them an on-campus network, so I've given them that, but if they left school at 10 o'clock to go to a, a school event, I'm just basically letting a network follow them. It's a pretty good line of thought. It helps with the fairness and equity of it. You didn't pick a STEM school, or you didn't pick a certain, said I can do it at this campus, but not that. You say, I'm doing it all campuses, but it's out of the library. You, got, you literally have to check it out, and it's really only for when the football team leaves at 12 o'clock on Friday because they got to go to the game. So just one thought relative to how some schools are approaching this. So that's really it. I think I have even inside of 30 minutes. So to recap, it's really three things for us. It's after you've defined your curriculum strategy, then we come in and say, how much on-campus network do you have? How much do you need? If you need more, we can do it in managed service. Once you have enough on-campus network, do you need to keep kids connected when they're in your bus, when they're going away? I can put them in one of these big routers and let 50 people access it. Then the last piece is, all right, how many kids don't have connectivity at home? If you need connectivity at home, I can provide that as well. Any questions? Was that too fast? I maybe went a little bit too fast. I didn't see any biscuits coming at me, so I thought maybe I should maybe slow down. Any questions? Going once, going twice. All right, well, thank you very much. Appreciate it. Uh, I'm Jonathan Blackwell with ABM, and this is my colleague, Dr. Roy, also with ABM. And we're going to talk to you just about a few trends that school districts are facing nowadays with rising costs, specifically energy, because we can have a huge impact on reducing that for you. And then we'll talk about solutions, but not necessarily our solutions. It's just Texas legislation. We just know how to use that legislation to get things done for you guys. How many different, are all you guys from different school districts? Everyone here, so we have 21, two, 22 different school districts here. Um, you guys know these trends. I'm not going to go bullet point by bullet point, but you have less and you're expected to do more. We need to get this stuff done. Where's the money? Let's find out where we can get the money from. That means some things often get deferred. So what we can normally do with the school district is go to the third bullet to the bottom and help you reduce the rise in utility costs that you guys experience on a daily basis. What this is right here is a report from the U.S. Green Building Council. It just states that schools have deferred maintenance. They're not getting to the things that they need to fix, i.e. your HVAC, a huge consumer of energy. So it gets older and older, kind of like an old car, right? The older it is, the worse the miles per gallon you get. Um, but also it states that 25% of your energy cost can be avoided. I had no idea our colleague Dan is out sick today, although I swear I heard someone say four in the background when he called me this morning. Um, Harris County is huge. You guys have a lot of schools. I mean, 800,000 students, that's a, uh, there's some functions, right? that's really big. So with that being said though, um, there's potential for a lot of improvements to be had there. But one thing that's also impacting Houston, the economy, and I wish I was here for the Exxon presentation, but oil has a big impact on us. And oil, I mean, this was done two days ago, but actually as of yesterday, oil is at 30, I mean, sorry, $27 a barrel, it keeps decreasing, right? So that means you're still stuck with doing more with less. You're not getting additional revenues. Your taxes are being impacted. So how can we help you out? One more, and I think we'll get to the meat and potatoes, no pun intended. <laughs> but, um, you know, K-12 is $8 billion a year. That's a big number when you write it out. It's a lot of zeros. 
is the second highest operating expense outside of your salaries, your colleagues' salaries, um, but it's one that you can actually control and reduce, but by reducing it, you'll improve your facility. If you reduce someone's salary, you're, gonna, you're not gonna get improved performance, you're gonna get some disgruntled people. You reduce your utility spend, that's good for everybody. So how do we do this? Well, what we look to do is fund the gap. You know, your resource demands are increasing, revenues, sorry, resources are increasing, revenues are decreasing, we look to fill the gap. The analogy I'll use is, say you guys have a $100 a month energy bill, or I, I wish, right, but $100 a month. What if someone came to you and goes, you know what, you're spending $100 a month because you, you have all this old stuff. You have old lighting, old HVAC, uh, you can't control your HVAC remotely or with any controls whatsoever. What if I can make that $100 go to 70 and out of that 70, I'll take 20 of it on a monthly basis and guarantee that you'll reach these savings annually. And you put that remaining $10 in your pocket. That's what we do with school districts. And you do that by looking at everything from the gentleman from Sprint talked about, looking at the internet of things, how to make you guys get real-time data to really see what you are doing on a daily basis. Because you really can't improve what you can't measure. And you can't manage what you can't measure and monitor. So let's give you guys the technology available to see what your facilities are doing. Let's upgrade your lighting. Let's give you a more efficient uh, HVAC units throughout your school district. And that's how we collectively, by bundling all these things together, that's how we're able to achieve these 15 to 40 percent enhancements or reductions in your energy spend. Here's a pretty little visual that Dan put together for us. Is you know your before picture represents your current utility spend. Your second one is is how we're going to reduce it. We're going to drop that orange down by about 20 percent. And the remaining top percent is what we're going to use to fund the project. Now, on the third bullet, you're going to see Texas Education Code 44.901. That states that a Texas Independent School District can enter into a performance contract as long as there's a guarantee tied to that contract. So we can go in there, work with you guys, assess the financials, work with your facilities team, look at your facilities, and then come back to you and say, based upon your utility spend, based upon what we've identified in our survey, we can take your annual bill from a million dollars down to $700,000. And we're gonna use that difference to fund the project and we're gonna guarantee you that you will achieve these savings. And if you don't, we have to write you a check for the difference. So the school gets new equipment, new lighting, new thermostats, some things that may not have a payback, but they were able to be bundled into this project. You don't pay for it out of capital. It's fully funded through the savings. And you have a company like ABM that's been around for over 100 years, financially strong, that's guaranteeing that your district is going to meet these financial obligations. Let me say a couple words on that, <clears throat> on performance contracting. You know, been around the business a long time and I talk to people a lot of times and, and performance contracting kind of gets a bad rap. I'm not exactly sure why, but let's kind of put it in perspective. If we do a performance contract and say we find you 2% money, okay, all right, what happens then is you're going to pay back that loan and because of the energy savings, you realize you, you actually put money in the general fund in most instances and you upgrade the equipment. If you do a bond election, what happens is you get 2% money, but you have to go through an election, you have to make everybody, all the taxpayers mad, don't think you don't have to do that with a performance contract. The other thing about it is, is with the performance contract, you get the guarantee. You get no guarantee if you do a bond election on those savings. The same thing is true if we'll talk to people and they say, we'll just do the work ourselves. And what we usually say is, well, why haven't you done it yet? Okay. Because what happens is, is that we have a tendency to continue doing what we've been doing, and that's to defer maintenance. You know, you guys operating on the, on the finance side, each and every one of you finds this question of the answer. I say, if you find out you have somebody stealing from you, you fire them that day. All right? Okay. Deferred maintenance on energy steals from you every day. We're talking to a district in West Texas, when we get into specifics, that's losing, is it 5000 a day or $6,000 a day lost because they're not upgrading their equipment. 
when you think about that, and, and one thing about Harris County, these are large school districts, so for most of you, the, the energy savings would be significant. So the, the point that I make on that is the guarantee is huge. And the other point of that is that you, you can find out about what the savings can be pretty simply. What we do is we come in, you know, the first thing we're going to do is we're going to take a look at your bills. We get a year or two monthly bills. We'll look at those. We have a spreadsheet we use, and we'll do a factor analysis on that. And we say, yeah, we think we can save this amount. Then if you're in agreement, we'll come back to you and say, okay, we want to do an investment-grade audit. Now, to this point in time, you have no skin in the game at all. So to find out going forward, when you get the investment-grade audit, what we will say is, all right, if we come back with the investment-grade audit and we say we can save you this amount, and then you decide not to go forward with savings and we say, okay, you're on the hook for the audit, okay, an amount that's determined in advance. Now, that kind of makes sense because why would you not go forward if you have a stated uh, guarantee that you're going to make this amount of savings? We've never had anybody do that, but that's out there. Now, there are some other entities that do some of this kind of work that have gone forward, and because school districts found out after the fact that they didn't provide the guarantee, some of those folks have backed away from from that and paid the audit and, and just don't. Yeah, you can always do a traditional project, right? There's nothing stopping you to work with a local GC, chemical contractor, electrician. You'll kind of do it yourself and have someone manage that for you. But if they're not going to guarantee it, you guys are out there on your own. You're kind of out there in the ocean without a life vest. Where your life vest? We'll never let you sink. Because if you start sinking, then that means we did a bad job on our audit. We need to write you a check for the difference. So we're in it together. Uh, win or lose. Um, we have 100% satisfaction rate with our customers throughout the country. Uh, we're everywhere from here in Texas to the east to the west and across both ponds. Um, we're flush with references. 12,000 employees in Texas. It's a big company. And an important thing to state too is uh, it, it just works. If we can identify a project, <coughs> be it us or someone else that you're working with, it's the, pro the program is out of Austin. They said schools don't have capital, but they have ways. Let's use that ways to fund these projects. So if you guys are looking at ways to free up funding, and get things done without having to utilize capital, performance contracting may be a route for you guys to go. Think, think about this too, guys, that <clears throat> what, what happens is if you go out and, and, you, and you do a bond and then you're, you, you're paying architects, you're paying engineers, and they're going out, and they're subbing all this out. I can tell you from my experience as a superintendent, you know, many occasions where I found out that those subcontractors who didn't do a very good job don't even exist anymore. Okay? Not only that, they don't exist, you can't find a forwarding address or a burial plot for them. Okay? So what happens with this going forward, realize that ABM, we don't farm this stuff out, we actually do the work. Okay? ABM will come in and, and actually replace the equipment, the guarantees. And when they do the energy upgrades on that, the other thing that we do is recommission all of that HVAC equipment. Okay? Make sure they've all got new belts and everything is clean and all those things are going forward. Because one of the problems you have is you can put new equipment in and how many of you run into this? You had a new project, you did build a school with bond money and you found out because of the way it was, the implementation of that and the, and the commissioning of the equipment wasn't done very well and it's not operating efficiently. We'll come back and make sure that that's for us, that's part of it. We have to make sure those savings are We're incentivized because if we don't do a good job even post-project, it's going to turn into us writing a check for the difference. We're not in the business to write checks. We are in the business to make money, but we make money by delivering phenomenal projects to public entities and private entities. But I think this is the, that was the last slide. So that's it for us. If you guys have any questions, I'd love to stick around and talk to you for a moment. Um, Dr. Roy, give out our cards. If you want to reach out to us, feel free to at any time. And um, thank you for sitting, well, thank you for staying awake. That was a big lunch you guys were eating. I was scared. You guys are going to fall asleep. But thank you for your time and attention. I appreciate the respect. I am uh, a member of the Texas uh, um, State Board of uh, a committee on the reviews uh, Gatsby exposure drafts. So I received two exposure drafts. Uh, that they're co contemplating going into effect probably next year. And so what I did is I just put a, a few highlights in your Gatsby update. One of them deals with fiduciary funds and the other one deals with um, asset retirement obligations. And we'll talk a little bit about that, uh, you know, what, what that is. It just seems like 
another entry, another things that we have to, to record at year end. So what I've been asked, uh, we're about a, a committee of about 10 people, and so we all get assigned about 10 pages of the exposure draft so we can comment and provide uh, uh, responses to the, uh, to, the, uh, to the exposure draft. Now, I did not give you the entire exposure draft, but if you want to have a copy of it, it's about 60 pages each. I'll have it available and I can send it to you electronically. And if you have nothing to read in a, in, in a, in a uh, Valentine's Day, so you can start reading uh, Gatsby, the next Gatsby update. So uh, I'll tell you why they're recommending it and how they're ab about to uh, implement it. So the first one deals with um, fiduciary funds. And I just gave you a little bit about Gatsby, what their, what, what their uh, purpose is to uh, review standards and make uh, users uh, of financial reports and to educate the stakeholders. So the first one deals with a proposed statement of four fiduciary funds, which would be required to be reported if required. The first one is pension. Well, we don't have pension. We include that in the government-wide, so we don't, I don't think we're gonna have to do that uh, uh, because we don't have a separate pension uh, for, for the organization. So investment trust funds, if you happen to have those, private purpose trust funds, and then the last one that we have uh, tentatively liked to be called agency funds, and now they're custodial funds. Uh, so the new name uh, of the fund will be custodial fund. What are the criteria to identify as a fiduciary fund is if the government controls the assets of the activity and one or more of the criteria is identified. One, you have a trust agreement. Two, um, you have a, um, not, you're, no, none of the individuals are required or residents uh, to be a beneficiary of the activity. Number three, neither of the financial reported entity or the residents will receive the goods or services. And uh, if it's a grant, the pass-through does, uh, does not have administrative or direct financial involvement in the program. So if the government controls the assets of the activity, then also you have uh, a fiduciary activity there. And then the last one covers any component units that you may have associated with the fiduciary activity. So, yes? How does this relate to uh, student activity funds? Well, that's the name of the, of the new fund called the story. Uh, but we, I don't have an agreement with anybody. No. Uh, uh, none of our campuses. I mean, no, if you, you, but if you control the assets, you can place them in the fiduciary activity. Uh, and they wanted to identify the criteria of placing it in a business activity or a fiduciary activity. And this clarifies a little bit more uh, what is the criteria to place it as a fiduciary activity. Um, well, now, you may not have an agreement, but it's one of those, let's go back to. Well, right, right now, we report our student activity funds in, in, as an agency. Uh, right. In our CAFR. Are we going to have to do something different? No, they're just going to be the name of the, of the fund is going to be a custodial fund instead of an agency fund. That's basically to the extent that it will, you will see it. Uh, same control, because you have control of the assets, right? Uh, they deposit the money there, and then you disperse it. So it's the same situation. Not that nothing's going to change other than the name of the fund. OK, so it'll, you, you'll, for all pur purposes for us, it's not going to have a major impact. It's primarily going to be for cities and counties that have pensions that will identify or, or will will impact their control activity for, for fiduciary activities. So control, if the assets are held by the government, again, for agency funds, we control the activity. We have, or we have the ability to administer and direct the use, exchange, or employment of the present service. So agency funds that we have, we control uh, when they get deposited and how they get dispersed. So. Um, so that's why it's an agency and it will be a, become a custodial, custodial uh, activity. 
Uh, you'll still report the additions and deductions from each fund type. And here's a nice flow chart that will kind of tell you whether it's a fiduciary fund or not. And the key thing for, for school districts here is do we have control of the assets? And if we do, then, then yes, it's a fiduciary activity. And second, it's for somebody else's benefit. Here's an example of the uh, balance sheet. Now, we're not going to have the first three columns uh, because primarily cities and counties will have those three columns. We'll probably just have the, the last one. And statement of changes in fiduciary net position. Again, the, the custodial uh, activity at the, at the very end. So, again, it was very, just a, a highlight. Uh, not many changes, at least for school districts, uh, uh, other than the name of the custodial activity. One of the things that uh, there was a question is that people that thought about a, an agency fund, they thought that we, they were an agent of the organization. And so they wanted to change the name from an agency fund to a custodial fund. It's easier to explain. It seems like to me, it's easier to explain. Yeah. We're talking about student activity funds, holding that. So it's really a clarification of, of some of the previous uh, activities. Um, the next one is a little bit more, um, a little different. It's a tangible asset, deals with retirement of uh, asset retirement obligations. And, and the only thing I can think of here for school districts is uh, if you're going to retire a, um, uh, an oil or a gas tank that you need to get rid of um, and you're not going to replace it, so then there's going to be a liability associated with, with that activity. And so the only, that's the only thing I can think of for a, for a school district. But here are some uh, definitions that you need to uh, think about. What is an asset retirement obligation? It's a enforceable liability associated with the retirement of a tangible capital asset. I think they made this one primarily because there are some uh, uh, cities and counties that may have a plant or may have some type of nuclear reactor or some type of uh, uh, chemical plant or elect electric plant that, that if they're going to retire it, it's going to have some environmental impact and, and some, some uh, uh, costs associated with, uh, with the retirement. Next, uh, they identified and they described contamination. And this is an event or condition normally involving a substance that is deposited around a tangible capital asset. In other words, a spill, something that spills as a result of the asset. Again, the only thing I can think of here for school district is a, it's a, a gas tank uh, or an oil tank that you may have out there that might, that might cause a, an exposure. Uh, current value, the amount of paid of uh, of services that would we require to acquire in the current period, and then uh, removal of the capital asset from service that that's what the retirement of a capital asset means. So, assets would be required to have a certain end of the useful life, and you'll have to be required to recognize a liability based on this guidance. So, in other words, um, if the, you meet the criteria, you'll be required to record a liability at the end of the year based on what you're going to uh, have to pay to uh, retire the asset and remediate the situation of if you have contamination or anything associated with that asset. Uh, how, how are you going to estimate the liability? It must be incurred and it must be reasonably estimated. So. If you know how much the estimate is and, and uh, you've incurred that liability, then you're going to record it. The termination of when, when the liability is incurred is based on the existence of any laws, regulation, contracts, judgment, together with the occurrence of an internal event. In other words, there's a new law that says that you cannot have any contamination associated with your uh, gas tank. Uh, or it obligates the government to perform uh, uh, an internal event, meaning that 
say the board or the city council decided that they were going to get rid of a particular asset and as a result it's going to cause some, some damage. So that is how you determine whether you have a liability. One, it's an external event or something internal that your organization decided that, hey, we're going to get rid of this asset, so it's, we're going to create ourselves a liability by getting ourselves out of that business. You can't just say, okay, I don't want that uh, nuclear plant anymore. Let me just walk away, you know, give it to somebody else. Well, because you decided to decommission it, now you need to, this, that's going to create a liability to clean it up and fix it up so that, so that you can uh, retire it. Uh, the best estimate uh, for this would be the, uh, based on the current value of the outlets expected to be incurred. In other words, you have to have some type of a projection of how, are you going, how much you're going to s uh, spend on uh, um, the, uh, the retirement of, of, that, of that asset. And so you would require that a deferred outflow of revenues associated with the obligation to offset the obligation in the future. Now, every year you'd have to evaluate this and determine and adjust it for inflation. So uh, if there's a significant change between one year and the next, then you're going to expense it out and allocate it over the useful life of the asset. I, so I venture to say that you know, if you have more than one year that it takes you to clean up or retire an asset, then then uh, uh, you have to do this calculation. Uh, you may be required to uh, set aside some funding to disclose how are you going to pay for that liability. A footnote that says, here's what we're going to retire, here's the asset, here's how much I'm going to uh, set aside for the retirement of the future retirement of that particular asset. The notes to the financial statements will require a description of the asset obligation, the methods and assumptions, the useful life of the capital asset, how much funding you have available, and the amount of assets restricted if not uh, displayed in the financial statements for uh, paying of this future liability. Uh, again, you're, you're recording a liability based on something that, that you're going to retire, so if it's going to cost you X amount of dollars to to retire, then you need to disclose that on the notes to the financial statements. Uh, again, I don't foresee this uh, a big deal for school districts unless you have some um, gas tanks that uh, you're going to retire that you're not going to use anymore. Then you need to uh, evaluate those and see if you're going to have a liability at the end of the year. I venture to say that your, your external auditor will be asking you a few questions at the end of the year and ask you, did you retire any assets that had any contamination or any issues that you need to uh, address at the end of the year? Um, and so these two will probably, uh, will have a meeting um, next week, uh, provide some comments. If you see anything that you like me to comment on that, uh, I'll be happy to send you the, uh, the, uh, um, the complete draft. It's about 60 pages uh, with the comments of how they arrived, that how they were handling it. So um, be happy to help you read it for me <laughs> as well. Yes. Is there any liability just for having the gas tank? It's only when you when you decide that you're, you're going to retire. retire. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. And then how much is it going to cost you to f clean it up? And so they want you to um, set it up as a liability and put in the notes and if there's going to be any amount that you're going to set aside for to deal with that project. Okay, I also gave you a copy of, I sent you, I think the other day, a, a, a proposal of the President's budget for 2017. Um, looks like they might e enhance a little bit of the Title I money, a little bit of uh, education and uh, after school programs and, and also uh, some uh, Head Start uh, uh, cost. Uh, they talk about uh, also adding some free uh, community college uh, to pay for uh, uh, one or two years or, or lower the cost of, uh, of going to school by, 
by uh, uh, high school students, uh, you know, for um, to reduce to the, make community college more affordable. So let's see if that gets uh, gets approved. From the proposal stage to what gets approved, sometimes it's it's like night and day. But but this is kind of a wish list from from the federal government. So. Um, that's all I have for you guys, unless you guys have any questions. Uh, there's a, uh, I'm not sure that we will have a March meeting, but I'll let you guys know uh, if, we, uh, if we have one. And uh, I'll send you guys a copy of the, of the updates uh, here for next month. Uh, please complete the evaluations and then uh, we'll have the certificates right in the front. And we'll see you guys. Have a great uh, Valentine's